I have just a few words to say to, uh, to welcome people. So welcome to this webinar uh, hosted by the Division of Civil Engineering at the University of Liverpool. So Liverpool, Liverpool is, is home to the University of Liverpool and of course also very much home to Liverpool FC. You might have uh, noticed, uh, um, those of you who follow the news, that we won the Premier League title the other day. So there was uh, some somewhat subdued celebrations due to, I guess, guess uh, health and, and safety concerns, but fans did make it to, to Anfield. Um, so um, what we... Uh, this is a, a new webinar series, and we have uh, the first uh, presentation today by Dr. Harvey from Monash University in Australia. Uh, and then um, in two weeks' time, we have a, uh, another really interesting speaker. And we have a list in the coming months here. We uh, are going to keep August free but then pick up in September again. So um, really good uh, list of speakers so far. Uh, and I'd like to say also that uh, those of you who have been following the Optum webinars, this is uh, kind of similar. It's similar and it's identical in 40, 45 minutes presentation and then conclude with a Q&A session. But this webinar series is, is somewhat more broad than the Uh, we'll start with a few presentations here, more in the geotechnical area, but we will also have um, uh, on topics in other areas of civil engineering, structural engineering, fluids engineering, coastal engineering, and which are uh, the kind of activities that are the main focus within uh, our division of civil engineering. So anyway, the first uh, speaker here today is uh, Dr. Ha uh, Harp from Monash University, who has a really interesting um, presentation on a, on a very, very interesting topic. So if you share your screen, um, Ha, and then I will, uh, uh, yeah, just, a few, um, just a few practicalities as well. As I said, we'll conclude with a Q&A session you will find at the bottom of the screen a Q&A button where you can type in questions and then uh, you can also raise your hand if you want to come online and ask a question to the speaker in person. Uh, so if you raise your hand, I will unmute you and uh, you can ask your question. And the webinar will be recorded and the link will send out to the participants uh, with the recording after the webinar. So over to you, Ha. All right. Um, thank you very much, Chris, uh, and uh, hello, everyone. And thanks for um, uh, attending my presentation. Um, also, thank Christian for organizing this uh, webinar. I think this, I'm uh, looking at a list of speakers that you have in your back screen. is really a wonderful sort of coming uh, lecture uh, that I would strongly recommend you guys to attend in the coming lecture. Now, for my topic today, I'm going to um, uh, to talk some of uh, to to talk to um, some of my current research activity on predicting the onset and port failure of geomaterial. So, more looking at uh, how we predicting the material behavior across the scale. So, before I'm looking at, uh, I'm going to present my presentation. I'm going to need to acknowledge some of my uh, collaborator. Um, probably you may recognize him. He's um, uh, Dr. Yang Wen from um, Adelaide University, uh, one of my long-term collaborators, and some of my uh, master and PhD students um, who have significant contribution to my talk today. And obviously, the last one is the funding support from Virtual University Cultural. Now, uh, to start my talk, I uh, would like to show you this example. And obviously, if you are working in the geotechnical engineer, um, obviously, uh, some of you might already know this example. This is a, a massive uh, telling dam uh, failure which occurred in Brazil last year um, in January. And this massive um, telling dam failure um, released a massive amount of toxics um, um, to the environment and killed more than 200 people. There's a lot of lessons learned that we learned from this, um, this, this event. Uh, in particular, after the, the event, we know that the, um, the 
tailing dams are having a, a very uh, well defined warning system uh, put in place, but it didn't work on the day it's needed. And um, the other thing is, um, it was reported that um, there was uh, uh, a regular inspection uh, a month before the, the failure occurred, but nothing was, was fired out uh, or even uh, any signal of the, of the collapse. Now this lesson learned actually asking other question, how do we or what can we do to minimize this problem given we're having a number of what you call here is the warning system and is present in place. And this drives uh, several interesting questions that as an academia and geotechnical engineer that we need to look at. For instance, uh, we have a regular inspection or risk assessment put in place, but a key question here would be, um, is this sort of the gravel inspection enough to prevent such a uh, catastrophic disaster? And secondly, we have the early warning system put in place, but it didn't work. Or even, even if it worked, could it help to prevent such a catastrophic disaster or not? And um, the next question would be, um, if we, uh, next question would be, what should we do to actually Mitimate, mitigate this sort of problem or to prevent this sort of problem. So as a geotechnical engineer, should we go beyond the onset of failure um, to predict the port failure? Because at the moment, as you know, that most of the, the geotechnical design at the moment looking at the safety factor, they, they, they don't, don't go actually beyond the onset of failure. Now, if you agree this sort of the, the solution is approach to go in the future to looking at something beyond the onset of failure, then we would face uh, several challenges in a conventional geomechanics. So what sort of challenge we are facing? Now looking at, again, this uh, problem here is a slow failure. Uh, obviously, at the looking at this failure here, you can see that um, this is a very large scale and the scale of problem would be in 100 meter to kilometer and that sort of thing, right? And the question here would be, how do we, uh, or what sort of numerical method that we should develop to, to, to predict this sort of behavior? Uh, so that is, is related to conventional tool. Now, if you're looking at the mechanism of a problem, you can see here the problem is actually occurred at a very large scale, but the origins of problem is actually occurred at a very small scale where you're having the particle rearrangement and this sort of rearrangement of particle actually is the cause triggering the failure at a, at a few scale. And at the moment, in our computational geomechanics, more of the um, the, the, the existing computational tool of transit model uh, basically um, ignore this sort of grand scale behavior. So what we normally focus at the moment is we're looking at the RBE scale right here. Here we mean we're developing a concept model and then we're using some sort of numerical tool like FBM and so on to predict the material behavior. But by even looking at this scale here where we have a concept model, what we normally do is we have a sort of thing like a track show test like what we have here. And we conduct a track so test, and then we develop a concept model. The concept model developed for this particular RVE scale. So what we do is we assume this, this RVE is homogeneous at the, at, the, at the entire element right here. We assume it homogeneous. But then we conduct a test, we obtain the stress-strain relationship, and then we develop some sort of the mathematical equation to fit this sort of behavior. But what we um, normally forget is, is, is the behavior of material at the, at the, at the lab scale. For instance, if you're looking at the material behavior, at particular at this location right here, before the location, what we call bifurcation point, if you're looking at the, the element test, you can see that the material or the RV are remain more or less homogeneous. But beyond this point, if you're looking at the material or looking at the spacemen or the track so test spacemen, you see very clear there is some sort of the localization bound or curve within the spacemen. And obviously, at this scale, you have the size specimen scale, and at the lower scale, you have this shear bound thickness scale, what they call the meso scale. And most of the existing concept at the moment, concept model at the moment, they ignore this scale. And as a result, we are normally fail to capture the localized behavior of the material. So the key question here is what can we do to capture all of this scale? And looking at this problem here, you have the grand scale, you have the RV scale, you have the shear bound scale, what we call the Marshall scale and we have the, uh, the few scale. And we involve four different scales, right? And on top of this, we're also having uh, what we call the multi-phase and multi-physical problem. Now, the key question here is how do we handle all of this? 
keep in mind that the, at the moment in the constant modeling, we're only looking at a single scale at this RBA. So what we're doing in our, in, our, in our work at the moment is we come up with a several simple approaches to, 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 to handle this problem. Now, um, the first approach here is at the RBA scale, we have two different scales. So what we're trying to do now is we're trying to bridge the scale. We develop a concept model to accommodate the two scale. And then the next step would be once we have in this constant model, we can capture these two scales right here. The next step would be connecting the grand scale into this scale. And finally, we develop a computational tool to accommodate the finding from the two scale and go to the few scale application. So this is our current approach. So for today's talk, I'm going to focus mainly on the number three component, which is the developing advanced computational tool to, to capture this, um, sorry, um, the, 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 to, to capture the outcome from um, number one and number two. I'm not going to focus on number two, but I'm going to touch in the base on number one to show you what are we doing at the moment to accommodate the two scale. And this comes to my, um, the content of my talk today. So I'm going to show you a very quickly um, in a few scale, uh, the fundamental of SP which is applicable for few scale problem. What can we do with the um, SP here, which mean uh, we're telling about uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics. And then I'm going to show you um, uh, very quickly how we develop a constant model to capture the onset and failure of material. Keep in mind that what I just explained before that at the moment, the constant model at the moment um, are failed to capture the onset and port failure of your material. And then I'm going to show you a couple of applica uh, application of SPS and our focus will be on a slow failure last line and a couple um, uh, two phase flow problem. And I'm going to finally, I'm going to end my presentation with a couple of the uh, conclusion and outlook. Now let's start with the SPS. So what is the SPS? The SPS is basically what they call smooth particle hydrodynamics. This is the, basically the mesh free methods which require no background mesh, all right? So in SPS, the computational domain, like what you can see right here, can be is represented by a set of particle, like this, what you can see right here. And each particle here occupies a given space in a computational domain and move free on a space. Now, in order to calculate the information at a particular location right here, what we're doing in SPS is to using what we call the interpolation process or the weighting average. One of the key advantages of SPS is capability uh, to model extremely large deformation like what you can see right here. Uh, and the main reason is because they have no background mass. And the other is keep in mind also that SPS is the continuum method, which is different from discrete element method with uh, uh, the, the, the dipping element methods. And the SPS also featuring what we call the non-local feature, um, which allows the methods to have a capability to mitigate the influence of um, mesh dependent solution. So that's also another interesting feature. Now I'm going to quickly explain the basic concept of SPS. This is the key SPS formulation which, um, which basically define the entire SPS concept. Now assuming that here, if you're having a few variable and a few variable here at a given location, for example, at this particular location here, if you want to calculate a few variable like stress or velocity or whatever uh, few variable, all you need to do here is to take in information at the neighboring particle or something like at this location, weight this with the, with the kernel function like what we have here. And basically you can see the few variable at a given location equal to the sum of all information at this particular area here, which you call the supporting domains, multiplied with the vol volume of the particle and weighting uh, with, the, with the, um, uh, the kernel function. And the kernel function must be symmetric and having the bell shape. This is the key formulation of SPS, which from here we can also um, um, uh, optimize, uh, approximate what they call the spatial derivative, which is very important in terms of component to approximate the governing equation. Now, uh, what you can see from here is that the spatial derivative of the function through SPS can be approximate in a very simple way. Um, it's basically um, you don't need to involve any some sort of space or derivative of a function, but instead you actually taking derivative of the of the kernel function. Now this is an interesting feature of SPS because even if you're having a discontinuity function right here, you don't have, a, have any issue because you don't taking derivative of the function so long as you're having the continuous smoothing function. And this helping the SPS method to be um, um, uh, to be able to 
uh, handle a lot of uh, problem, all right? Now, this is the two key basically equation that we can see forming the basic of SPF. And if you want to learn SPF, these two equations, you need to understand, that's it. And there's nothing else you need to understand. Now, the next question would be, how do we apply the equation? Now, let's, I'm going to show you a very quick or very simple way to, uh, to approximate, uh, to apply this, this SPF equation. Now, looking at the governing equation, uh, for any continuum system, solids, fluid, soil, or whatever system, uh, is always following this what we call governing equation, right? Uh, assuming the isothermal system. Now, the governing equation, uh, the governing equation here consists of the mass, the momentum, and the constant relation. And obviously, if you want to solve this system equation, you need to decretize or approximate this spatial uh, derivative. Now, through SPS, um, this process is very straightforward. For example, uh, let's say if I'm considering the momentum conservation equation, all I need to do is to approximate the term, right? The spatial derivative of stress. And what I can do from here is I'm going to use the SP approximation, directly convert this term to here. You can see all the terms are remain the same except this one, right? This is spatial derivative. And as you can see right here, the gradient of a spatial derivative of stress tensor now can be converted into the spatial derivative of the kernel function. And this term can be easily approximated in SPS. And as a result, this equation here is the ordinary different equation. We can be solved easily using some sort of standard leap rock algorithm and so on. And you can see this very simple mass, simple approach, straightforwardly uh, approximate a very complicated equation through the SPS, right? Now, I'm not going to detail of SPS, but what I'm going to show next is I'm going to show you some sort of the capability of SPS. For instance, um, when you're looking at a numerical method, one of the first things probably you need to consider is the accuracy, right? The accuracy of SPS. So what we're doing here is in SPS, we're looking at the constitutive response in SPS. So we try and what we're simulating here is we, we're simulating the constant volume sharing problem. So we're having some sort of the soil element right here, and we share the element at a constant volume. And we're using quite complicated concept model here, which is the Dafalias constant model, critical state, so mechanical constant model. And you see, this is the, the constant response. This is the stress path, stress path and stress strain behavior for three different types of soil, dense, medium, dense, and loose. The rest one here, is represent the element test, which is the, the uh, type of the numerical solution. And uh, the solid, uh, the, the, the so, uh, empty dot here represent the SPS solution. And you can see that uh, at, as, at the constant level, the SPS can predict very well this sort of the material behavior, which subjecting us with the SPS, we can have a good accuracy um, to, to, to apply to all the uh, problem. And even here, you're looking at the track seal problem. You can see that this problem here, here involve extremely large deformation, and we can still capture very well the stress loading parts right here, except at this location, we start having a little bit deviated from uh, from the, uh, the stress loading path, but it's mainly due to the, um, the, 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 um, the boundary value problem or the, uh, uh, what you call a structural failure problem. Um, uh, and when we uh, bring the SPA to what you call boundary value problem, we can also access the uh, accuracy of SPA. For example, here, what we're trying to do in, in this particular case is we're analyzing the bearing capacity problem and we compare our solution with, with Plexis. This is uh, on a very popular um, software package that more of you probably already knows. And you can see that the SPS can predict uh, very well um, the Plexis result for 50 node elements, right? This is very high accuracy CF, um, FEM Plexis solution. And here you can see the share band predicted by SPS is also pretty good um, agreement with, with FEM. But um, uh, the advantage of SPS, of course, is, is to go further, uh, for example, like this particular case here, when you, you want to looking at some extreme problem like granular flow, we involve significantly large information um, uh, and the SPA can handle this problem. For example, in this particular, particular case here, we conduct a two-dimensional granular column collapse and we're looking at how the, the material behave and we're looking at the uh, runout distance and this sort of the, uh, the collapse uh, process. And we simulate this problem by SPS right here and you can see that 2D or 3D problem, we can capture very well with, with the SPS. Now, this is, remember, it's extremely large information and it's not that easy to, 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 to predict using some fundamental methods. We can also um, uh, be able to, with SPS, we can also um, be able to successfully predict what we call a soil structure interaction problem. And this is the, a couple of example 
um, I, 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 I conduct back to the time when I was in Japan. Uh, I'm working with a, 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 a what we call the sedentary honey was system company. So what they're doing is they have they have some sort of thing like a sedentary honey was system, and the block here would be uh, one meter high. That sort of block, and they want to optimize this sort of uh, uh, the, the block shape, shape, right? And and what we did here is they don't have any any advanced numerical methods to to predict this sort of problem, uh, and it's very costly to conduct a large scale test. So what they, uh, we're trying to do here is we develop advanced computational solution and from a numerical simulation, we can change the shift of the block and we can predict what is the optimal shift. And you can see this here, we can simulate very well. This is experimental prediction um, um, uh, of the soil structure interaction problem. And this is numerical simulation. So we can predict fairly well this sort of application or even the problem of the um, solid object penetrating to the, to the soil, we involves the significant large deformation uh, we can also be handled by SPIRT. So a couple of slides show you what is the capability of SPIRT. And then this is the last, uh, another one which is showing uh, the application of SPIRT to looking at the soil action mechanism. And this is another project we're working on. Um, um, basically, we are um, trying to uh, figure out the, uh, the mechanism of soil action, how, is, how the shear band is developed uh, underneath the pie embankment. Uh, and looking at the, how the load reduction uh, taking place in the pine embankment. And you can see this sort of thing can be um, involves extremely large deformation, especially at this particular location here, uh, which is not easy task for FPM or any other numerical method to handle. Uh, this sort of thing can only be simulated with free methods, FPM, uh, MPM, um, particle final elements, and SP and, and so on. Now, so this is a couple of slides showing you the capability of SPS. Uh, the next um, um, uh, topic of my talk would be, all right, if you're having a numerical method capable of handling large deformation, then the next question would be, how do I model the, the behavior of material accurately, right? So this is the, this is the come to the concept modeling parts, right? You can have a numerical method to handle large deformation problem, but you need a correct concept model to capture the material behavior. For example, here, if you will go to the, the few scale, you want to predict this sort of problem at the few scale. What you normally do is you take the sample from the field, you conduct the test, and then you get a stress strain relationship and you, build the, you develop a concept model. And using that concept model in the numerical methods like SP8, FEM, or whatever concept model uh, to predict the material behavior. Now, this is the sort of the existing assumption of the, of the concept model. When you develop concept model, you need to define the RVE, right? Which is something like what we have right here, the RVE. At the moment, all existing concept model assume the RV is to be homogeneous. That is the very strong assumption, right? And then we also assume at the moment uh, in existing concept model, we also assume that strain gradient is continuous across the RV, right? Across the RV, we have continuous strain. And also we assuming that there's a unique stress strain relationship. So what I'm going to show you next is this sort of assumption is very strong and not valid for most of the case. And because it's very strong and not valid, then we need to write a question whether existing concept model can capture the localized failure behavior of material or not. If you're looking at the material here, this is the, basically the specimen obtained from the track so test. During the port failure, you're having the stress strain relationship right here, right? This is the location where you had the port failure and, and at this location, um, uh, you normally observe this sort of material behavior here. And obviously you can see this is one RVE, right? And within the RVE, the material outside here behave different from the material inside this localization bar. So basically within one RVE, you have two different behavior of the material. But we assume that there's a unique stress strain relation. So clearly this assumption does not represent the physics of them observed from experiment, right? So what can we do to address this problem? So here is our strategy. This is the, the again, we go back to the track show test, like what we have. We have, this is the, when we're looking at the, at the specimen and we're looking at a stress strain behavior. Now, we're starting from here. We load the material and before the bifurcation point, right? When we're looking at the, looking at the experimental specimen, we see that the RVE here are still more or less homogeneous. So because this RVE is more homogeneous, so the RVE for the first section here is okay. Right, basically, for this particular session, right, before the bifurcation, existing concept model work because it can capture all sort of the, 
um, uh, behavior. There's no some sort of the uh, localized failure. But if you go beyond this point, right? Beyond this point here, if you're looking at the material, right? You can see this is the behavior that you observe in the experiment. And at the RVE scale, you actually observe this sort of behavior. You can see the RVE now having a very clear some sort of share back. Um, if you're looking at or you're using some sort of different technique like um, uh, digital um, uh, image processing technique, what you can see is that the material here behave differently from this sort of the material inside the, the localizing zone. And in particular, particular, what we observe is that the material outside the localizing zone undergo unloading, while the material inside the localized zone it continues to undergoing uh, sharing of lattice deformation. What you normally measure in the experiment is the boundary very problem somewhere right here, which is basically the average of these two, right? This is what you measure from the experiment. And this is the macro scale, right, behavior of IVE, which consists of the behavior of outside, which is this area, and the behavior of inside, which is that area, right? But obviously, from here, you can see that you have, if you're having only one single currency model, you will not be able to capture this behavior. So our approach is very simple. We're going to use more than one stress strain relationship. So what we did here is we, looking at the experimental result, we're going to define what they call a new RVE. This is our new RVE, and this RVE reflects what we observe in the experiment. In the experiment, we see this sort of the localization zone, and in our RVE, we have a localization bar. And this localization bar is featured by the shear band thickness and also the orientation. Right? And if you're accepting this as um, a new definition of RVE, what you can see from here is we can separate the RVE deformation. Right? This is the material outside, and this is the material inside, which is localized zone. And after we separating the behavior of the inside and outside material, you can see right here that this outside can be now considered homogeneous, while the inside here you can see also considered a homogeneous. The key question would be, how do we connect them together, all right? Now, this is our approach. When you have the um, new RVE defined like what we have right here, an um, RVE embedded with a localizing band, obviously the strain profile have to be different. And this is the new some sort of kinematic enrichment we impose for this, for this element, right? So we have the strains for the outside material and we have for strain for the inside material. And of course, we define a volume fraction of the localization band with the entire RVE right here. So we can have the kinematic enrichment here. We have the total strain equal to the portion of strains uh, of the outside uh, and another portion of the, of the strain inside. And obviously, the strain inside can be calculated using the well-known uh, strain localization theory proposed by Wadolakis. So how will we connect? The whole idea is, okay, if you have a new RVE, you have the kinematic enrichment for this RVE. Now the next step would be, how do you connect the behavior inside and outside? So what we're doing here is very simple. We assume that, okay, for outside material, we use the standard currency model. For inside material, we use the standard currency model. And then we're going to use, impose some sort of a virtual work equation. And based on a virtual work equation, we can obtain this sort of the internal equilibrium condition. We're telling you here that at this particular interface, the traction of the inside material and the traction of the outside material are the same. And based on this condition, we end up with this new currency model. And this currency model here featuring the size of the, of the localization band. And this is the very important feature. And because the currency model here featuring the size of the localization band, it can predict of, uh, the, the scale dependent behavior. All right, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how we, uh, how the concept model behave. This is our new RVE, and we're assuming that the concept model following a very simple Volmises U criteria uh, with the linear strain softening. And we load the element, right? What you can see right here, this is the stress and strain relationship. Now the rest curve here represent the classical concept model, which means the RVE without this sort of inside uh, the localizing bar. And, 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 and you see you have a unique stress strain relationship for the classical currency model. But with our model, you can see that now if you change the shear band thickness, you get different response, right? If the shear band thickness here is equal to the RVE, 
then basically what you can see is our model go back to the classical currency model. But if this Shearman thickness is smaller than RVE, our model scale very well with the, with the Shearman thickness. Which means this model is actually represented physics because the localization band it actually represents how much energy is facing from the, from the material. And we're also looking at the material right here. If you're looking at the material outside localization zone, you can see that this is the loading part and this is the unloading part. So we get exactly what we are imposed at the beginning. And the material inside, this is the loading part, and upon the reaching the bifurcation point, it keeps going like, like that. So what is the benefits? Now, one of the simple benefits, uh, which is obvious that you can see from our model, is the its capability to remove the mass bias. For example, in this particular case here, we simulate a simple bioxyl test for three different mass resolution problems, right? And again, we're assuming the simple currency model. And this is the, um, the, 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 the stress strain response from this simple bioxyl test. And you can see that classical currency model giving different results for different mass resolution. But with our new two-scale concept model, we get more or less the same results. And more importantly, when you're trying to predict the shear band, right? You try to predict the thick shear band thickness. What you can see here is in the classical concept model, you get different shear band thickness and different orientation as well. You can see that. But in the proposed model, we get more or less with similar result and orientation in some other shear band thickness, right? More importantly, when you combine this model here, with SPH, you can see this is the five different uh, numerical simulation with different uh, metric solution, ranging from 390 to 2800. You can see that our model can capture exactly the same Shearman thickness orientation and also lead load displacement. Now you can see this, this the capability of the of the new currency model defined in a very simple way. We can completely remove the metric independent problem. All right. So we have the concept model in hand. Now we can actually move into some sort of application, which is the, the third part of my presentation. All right, um, I'm going to show you a couple of, of, of applications of, of, of SPS. So I'm going to focus on the slope failure. And then if I have time, I'm going to explain uh, a couple of uh, example on the um, couple of hydromechanical problem. Now, when we're using uh, a numerical tool for slope failure and landslide, this is a problem. Well, what we normally looking at is safety factor of potential failure surface, right? This application can be well predicted by standard numerical methods like um, limit equivalent method, FPM, and so on. But what we are looking at the, the example, the first example I show you in the first slide, uh, obviously what we want is we want to go beyond the onset of failure, looking at port failure uh, or landslide, the bridge flow, that sort of thing. Uh, and therefore, we need uh, some sort of advanced method techniques. Uh, but let's see how what is when we apply the SPA to the slope failure problem. And uh, this is something of uh, uh, interesting application. Uh, for example, uh, for a simple case uh, of the cut slope, uh, we using the SPA and we trying to predict the final element solution. Third one, right? So we're looking at the safety factor and we're looking at the, the potential failure surface. Now you can see here with SPA. Uh, many people actually telling SP is time consuming, but it's not easy case. That's not okay because as you can see from here, we can have the, with SP, we have about 1200 particles, with FEM, we have about 8100 nodes. And we can capture very well the, what, uh, the, 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 the safety factor and the, and the, the failure surface uh, obtained from the FEM. But on top of that, we can also simulate extremely large information like what you can see from here. We can also uh, be able to predict um, the large deformation for um, non-homogeneous slope, where you're having different type of the, uh, of the soil and involving uh, the water as well. And this is safety factor predicted by, by SPA compared with different methods. And this is the, um, the, the, the post-failure process predicted by SPS. And obviously, uh, compared to FPM, we cannot simulate large deformation. And keep in mind, this is very simple, some sort of the, the model. We will also uh, be able to predict something like 3D. Uh, for example, like this case, we are simulating the three-dimensional slope failure and compare our solution with FEM. Uh, and we can predict uh, very well what FEM uh, would do for, uh, for, for the deformation before the onset of failure. But obviously, after, after that, we can also predict this uh, by this solution. And the other, uh, probably another interesting application that, uh, that we need to go beyond our set of failure is, is to looking at the large deformation of the soil calvation. This is a, go back to the 2009, this is a quite interesting uh, experiment conducted by ITO. 
So what they're doing here is they're having a very large scale slope and uh, they install a number of instruments in the slope. And what they're trying to do here, they try to predict um, um, when the slope is collapsed, subject to the uh, stage excavation, right? So basically they're doing the stage excavation right here, right? And they see when the slope is collapsed. And they're using a finite elements uh, method to predict um, uh, this sort of equipment. Now what you can see interesting result from here is the finite element solution actually giving you the continuous settlement without any collapse. But in the reality in the experiment, the slope actually collapsed at the, uh, after you excavate after a depth of 2.5 meter. So we're using the SPS and, and, and we could capture very well the location when, when the, um, the slope was collapsed. So this is the, another interesting feature which uh, basically uh, suggesting that we should go beyond on set failure rather than keeping it at the, at the before a set failure. And the other uh, application in this, in this area is looking at extremely large deformation related to landslide debris flow. And this is another interesting application of SPS. So um, in this particular case, we're looking at the, um, the, the impact of debris flow on the structure. So what we're doing here is uh, uh, we're looking at, um, this is the, the collaboration research between our group and a group in Hong Kong where they're having a number of landslide debris flow program. So what they're trying to do over there is they're trying to come up with what they call the buffer configuration to basically minimize the impact of debris flow to the salary infrastructure. And, and because they don't have some sort of the advanced numerical method, so they have to conduct a very large scale experiment up to um, a, a 10, 20 meter high and, and that sort of thing. They're even thinking to go up to um, 20, 30 meter high. So th this is the, um, um, interesting uh, application because at the moment there is no some sort of design guideline to design the buffer right so how you design the buffer here is not clear at all so for example should you design the buffer something like that or or, or, or a different sort of configuration so we're trying to do here is we're trying to using a numerical method to optimize um, the location of the buffer and what you can see from here is this is the uh, the simulation result we conduct is by sps and this is the location of buffer and for this simulation, we're having buffer, and this one we have no buffer. Uh, and you can see that um, the how effective buffer are due to basically retain the flow. Um, uh, presumably, if you're having some sort of the, the structure right here, then you can basically reduce the speed of the of the debris flow before the impacting the, the the infrastructure. Now, for this particular case, um, with the numerical simulation, we can actually have to looking at the mechanism of the repeat flows, right? For example, we can looking at how the, the flow passing through the, um, the, the buffer, or we can looking at how the force acting on a buffer. For example, here we having three different layers of, of the buffer, and we can access what is the maximum force acting on each of the, of the layer, that sort of thing. We can also looking at something other interesting application, for example, what sort of the, uh, the, the barrier system uh, are, are most effective? For example, here we're looking at three different systems. We're looking at the buffer, uh, short buffer, we're looking at the high buffer, and we're looking at the dam here over here, what you call the check dam system. And we compare the performance of the of different, different system. And interestingly here, you can see that for the short buffer, the peak force is actually right at a location when the debris flow impacting um, the, the buffer. But for the tall buffer, like what you can see right here, the peak fault actually um, uh, occur after the, um, the flow impacting the buffer. We're suggesting that there's significant some sort of flow retention uh, in this sort of system. And then we're also looking at um, uh, this uh, method also helping us to look at the energy aspects of the, of the design. Um, for example, we can, we, can, um, uh, we can measure the total energy dissipation and kinematic energy and also potential energy. Now this of, of analysis show a very interesting sort of finding. Um, for instance, when we design some sort of the barrier system, we're normally looking at the total energy dissipation. But this is not the case because if you're looking at the total energy dissipation here, this line is corresponding to the flow without any buffer, that means the free flow. So you can see that without buffer, you're getting basically the highest sort of the energy dissipation. But so long as you're having some sort of buffer, buffer system here, you have less energy dissipation. But that doesn't mean it's good because uh, you're looking at here for the kinematic energy, like what you can see right here. Without buffer, you have a significant kinematic energy. 
But with the with the, with buffer, you having a very low kinetic energy. That's sort of thing that you can see right here. And and this sort of 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 of, of, of methods actually helping us to looking at how or, or how sort of the configuration could help us to to basically design uh, this sort of system, right? And then uh, this is another example which show you uh, basically the capability of our port to predict uh, the landslide. And in this particular case here, we try to back analyze the DB flows um, uh, of the mouth Thailand in Washington. So basically, this is the, the landslide problem occurred in back to 1980, uh, which was caused due to the earthquake, uh, triggering a large volume of DB flows, kill a lot of people. And we don't have a lot of data, but we can actually having some sort of the initial configuration and the current configuration of slope and we can basically back analyze and uh, this sort of problem and here we having um, the dimension up to uh, 100 kilometer that sort of thing this, this was achieved recently using our very high uh, advanced computational code all right so that is the, a couple of sv application for the uh, for the uh, for the slope failure I'm going to have a um, few more minutes. I'm going to show you very quick uh, some of our current application of SPS for a couple of problems. So when you're looking at a couple of problems here, you're normally um, interested in uh, how you're actually predicting the internal erosion process or how you're actually looking at the flow inside and outside post media and, and also the overtopping flow, that sort of thing. And this is actually one of our uh, latest uh, discovery project looking at the internal erosion. So within the SPS, we're having uh, several different models um, to model the flow through the post media. Uh, we can have the single layer uh, or we can have the multiple layer. And within a single layer, we can model even dry, saturated and unsaturated uh, material. So the basic concept here is for single layer, um, we mean we have single particle carrying information of dry soil. Or for saturated soil in a single layer, we have the single particle carry out information of two phases. Or for the three phases here, we have single layer, single particle, carry out information of three phases. Or for multiple layer, what we're doing here is we simulate different phases with different set of particles. For example, with two phases, we do two different set of particles to simulate um, water and soil. For three phases, we do three different set of particles, that's our thing. So I'm going to quickly show you this sort of the, the result here for two phase system. And this is two phase system when you have the uh, fully saturated soil uh, like this. So basically the fully saturated soil can be represented by two different layers of water and soil. And when you do the simulation, we are basically solving these two systems separately, right? And you're going to have something like what we have like this. You're having the soil, you're having water, and they can overlap, they can flow through each other. And then this flow process here, the interaction between two phase can be described using the, what they call the ship wave forces or the piece of effective stress uh, concept, that sort of thing. Now, this is an example, we quickly show you how we simulate the, um, the, the two-phase flow problem. This is an example conducted by laser in 2013 for the ship phase flow through the rock field dam. And we have our own material property here. We have different flow rate uh, imposed uh, at this location, um, uh, passing through the rock field dam. And this is the, uh, the SPS simulation result. And you can see right here, this is the, the, the experimental measurement of the pore water pressure at this particular location right here, right? And the red line here represent our numerical solution. And you can see that we can predict fairly well this of system. And you can see from here, this is the solid layer and this is the water layer. They actually um, overlapping each other. And we can even go beyond this to predict large deformation of this particular case where you have the ship wave flow through the embankment causing the internal erosion somewhere right here and causing the collapse. And this is the failure process that we were able to simulate it. Um, and this is the experimental result. And this is the failure surface predicted by our numerical model. And obviously for FEM, you are stopping here because you cannot model large deformation, right? And however, what happened here is because we are using two phase problem, we actually fail to capture this sort of thing, right? There's some sort of the internal erosion process or some sort of decontinuity failure surface were unable to capture this sort of behavior. So to capture this problem, we need, we need to go further to three phase system looking at uncertain soil. And obviously for this particular case, we need to solve the multi-phase equation involving the soil, water, air, uh, and so on. And these are a couple of examples of the single phase SPS. So basically one SPS particle carry the information of three phase air, water, solids. 
This is an example of the unsaturated seepage flow through one dimensional soil column, comparison between the, uh, theoretical and SPS sol solution. And this is an example of the SPS um, solution for, un again, unsaturated seepage flow uh, through the, um, the earth field dam that you can see right here. And in this particular case, we actually using a very complex mass, what we call a boron system, to perform the SPS simulation. And this is the solution predicted by SPS and other, other solutions. We have been also successfully using this of the single layer system to predict the experiment. Back to the 2004, the experiment were conducted by Xiong. They're using a very simple slope and they supply the water from here or from there. And then they measure the pore water pressure at a couple of locations. And this is the comparison between experiments and the simulation. Um, we capture very well some sort of the seepage flow before the failure, but this location here we cannot capture because uh, we didn't consider the deformation of the soil. And finally, um, we are also using the model to predict extremely large deformation of slopes. So basically, we're having here uh, the experimental uh, test uh, for a shallow slope failure conducted by Circle in 2011. So what they're doing here, they're having the shallow slope, and then they separate the slope to rainfall right here. And then um, what they're doing here is they, they're looking at how the slope failure. So you, they're actually using 3D scanner to capture this sort of the morphology. So we're doing exactly the same sort of setup and we supply the water flow from here. And you can see this is how the water flow accumulates through the, the slope. And this is the, the failure surface. This is the sort of the uh, 3D uh, uh, laser scanner capturing the, the, the failure morphology uh, from the experiment. And this is our space solution. So when we, uh, we, we, we supply the water from here based on the rainfall plus, uh, we get the reduction in instruction and, and at the end it causing the slow failure like what you can see from here. So this again telling you that uh, the SPS methods in combination with the, with the advanced model can capture a very complex problem in both the multi-phase, multi visit And this our problem now can be, can be used to solve the, uh, the issue that, that, that I, I, I presented in the, in the first slide. So with this, I, uh, I would like to, uh, ah, I have another one with the last application here, which is probably another interesting application that you might want to look at. This is the experimental test of soil desiccation in dew cracking. So basically you have a rectangular soil column, or we have this, um, the uh, circular dish, that's sort of the soil layer. So what we're doing here is we, is we subtract the, uh, we dry the soil space, right? Let the moisture to evaporate from here. And then we're looking at how the crack develop in the soil. And along this direction, we have a change in the thickness, right? Increase in the thickness. And also from here to there. And this is the simulation. You can see that very complex failure surface can be predicted by SPS. Right? When you increase the thickness, you get um, the density of crack actually reduced. We, kept, we can qualitatively capture this mechanism. But of course, it's very difficult to capture exactly what happened here because the soil is, is highly non-homogeneous in nature. So with this, I would like to end my presentation uh, and I have a couple of key conclusions. Um, the first conclusion is it related to currency model. It's very important to having a suitable currency model to capture the onset and port failure. And in our view, most of the existing currency models fail to capture this sort of behavior because they did not uh, consider the localization zone. And for large-scale application, we need a robust numerical method. And obviously, SPS is not the only one. We have a number of different math-free methods, uh, but different methods having their own advantage and disadvantage. And finally, at Monas, we're currently having a high, very high-performance computing course, which uh, are valuable for few-scale application. So if you're interested in, uh, in this sort of, of, of um, application, let us know. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, ah, that was extremely interesting. Um, uh, really interesting and uh, some very advanced uh, analysis and, and simulations and a uh, really interesting approach to um, this, I think, long-standing problem of how to actually deal with localized deformations. Um, we will uh, we will get we will take some questions now and and um, uh, so the first question is uh, in your three-phase flow example, um, what, what kind of, I, I think the question is what kind of... Um, yeah, uh, yeah so basically the... Hydraulic model. Uh, hydraulic uh, model. We use a, we, at the moment we use a very simple hydraulic model. 
Um, we, this is a very new result we achieved very recently and we're still using a very simple uh, Van der Chen, uh, Van der Chen um, high frequency model. So we're having a plan to use a more uh, advanced concept model later on. Yeah. Um, I would like to, uh, there's a, a couple of questions as well on the, um, on the SPH, not so much on the, on the technicalities of the SPH itself, but on sort of how it compares with other numerical methods, um, FEM, MPM, and so on. And of course, uh, the main distinguishing feature, I think, uh, in comparison to the FEM is that, as you pointed out several times, that it can handle arbitrarily large deformations. There's no real sort of difference between large and small deformations, right? It's, it's just deformations. What about um, computational times? So that, that's, that, that's actually a very interesting question. Now, most of people, when they read the, the literature, they always say uh, the SVM method is very time consuming. Mm -hmm. I, to be honest, I was surprised with that sort of comment. Um, in, in general, math-free method is more time-consuming than, than math-based methods. That is the common sense. But when we're trying to simulate the, um, when we're doing the sum application, for example, um, I, let, let me go back to, um, to a couple of the, um, the slides I showed earlier. Um, 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 this is an example of, 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 of probably um, a fair comparison between the SPF and the FEM. As you can see, for this particular case here, uh, we could get a very good solution compared to FEM with just 1,200 particles. And this simulation right here, uh, we conduct this probably we done within a couple of seconds or uh, uh, less than a minute to get this of, 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 of solution. So the SPH? Yeah, with the SPS, less than a minute to get this solution with 100, uh, 1200 particles. Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, in common sense, I agree that the mass-free methods is more um, uh, time consuming than mass-based methods uh, for some particular application, but not on the case, right? Sure, and, and um, how about the um, time integration, uh, implicit, explicit, uh, the possibilities for parallelization. Uh, how about steady state solutions? Uh, you want to com compute steady state solutions? This is the steady state solution. Now, um, the quad is steady state for the flow, right? For the sheet based flow, you mean? Uh, well, I meant just uh, sort of, uh, not steady state, sorry, quasi-static. So if you want to do ah, that. That's a very good question. Now, at the moment, we don't have the quasi-static SPS solution. And that is the probably, perhaps the most, you are pointing to the right, um, right point, the most time consuming factor of SPS is the explicit solution where you require a very small time step to, yeah. to, to, to ensure the numerical stability. So that's it different. So, so is, is that the in is the time of stepping is it explicit or implicit or it can be if there's choice or? it explicit it explicit it needs to certainly uh, satisfy some certain condition yes sure so there's the possibility of parallelizing it is is that right or yeah that we only uh, at the moment we have fully parallel computing SP code uh, at the moment okay okay based on the explicit uh, framework. Okay, and, and you showed some 3D problems as well at the end there with the barriers, with the, um, the baffles yeah. and the, the dams there. Uh, any any uh, challenges there in going from 2D to 3D uh, or is it just, um, it just follows naturally or? I mean, there yeah, could be the, longer times of course, but longer computational mm -hmm. times. Yeah, the good thing of SP is the, the concept is very simple. Um, you can go easily from 2D to 3D, uh, basically to extend one more dimension. So yeah. um, we don't have any, any trouble in extending from 2D to 3D. Uh, and to be honest, even a master student could do that, that job. Uh, okay. But obviously, parallel computing is a different story. But actually, in fact, this solution I obtained here was, was obtained by one of my current master students. So he's doing the fully parallel SPL code. Uh -huh. So you uh -huh. can see And how, how long, <laughs> I mean, no, this is not a... Maybe a very fair question, but very fair question. This is simulation is sort of uh, takes about three seconds or so. No, uh, no, this one is not. This yeah, one no, no. Is you have a you have a you have a time. You, it says two point five five one seconds here. So that's the real time. How how long does it actually take to compute a three D solution like that? 
for this one, uh, for this particular case, we simulate up to uh, several million particles, and we're using a very high performance the NCI, the National Computing System uh, in, in, in Canberra. Yeah. And this one, this, this, this the entire simulation process here take uh, um, around one and a half hour uh, oh. in, the, in, in the fully parallel uh, computing system. Uh, uh, okay. And how many, how many cores is that with? Uh... We using for this particular case, uh, we are using um, around five hundred cores. Okay, 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 yeah. okay. Uh, um, really interesting. Let's let's see. Let's have a look at some other questions. Um, there, was, there was a question on the basic difference between SGIT and FPM. This this is a, a very basic question. Is basically uh, S, a simple answer is the SPS have no background mass. And the FEM, re the MPM require the background mass, and on top of that, they have the material coil. So what they're doing in the MPM is they're solving the Golden equation on a background mass, and then they convert to the material coil, moving material coil, reset the mass, and put it back. But in SPA, we don't have that problem. We 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 solve everything on a particle. So that is the key key difference. Yeah, and then you mentioned the kernel function. You, but you didn't yeah. talk about that in detail. Um, is that something that's sorted out completely or any room? Yeah, this one is, um, we don't use, we don't have to change the kernel function. Um, we're having a couple of very stable kernel functions that we can use at the moment. And, and um, it doesn't actually influence a lot in terms of numerical solution. Okay. Uh, liquefaction. Ah, is that something you have given any thought to or, or, and solved uh, sort of? Yes, I have work? very good. Um, I have actually a PhD student working at the moment on liquid fraction. And, and that's probably why you're seeing this. Uh, so we are, we are doing at the moment, do you see this one here? And this one. So this is the, this is the one we are doing at the moment. So we, uh, we have been uh, implement this sort of the critical stage so conceived model capable of capturing the fully liquid fraction behavior in SPS and we're having a group actually currently working in this, this particular case at the moment. Yeah, great. Um, um, there is a uh, There is a ah, question. Pas Ma Manolo. <laughs> 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 Thank you. So this is another pioneer. We have, um, uh, it's, it's great pleasure to see uh, Manolo actually here. Uh, one of the pioneer um, uh, SPS developer and he's expert in the uh, SPS modeling of the free flow as well. Uh, liquid fraction. Yes, we are doing at the moment, Manolo, and I hope to show you in October. <laughs> um, about this two-scale or this, this multi-scale approach, um, yes. you mentioned the thickness of the shear bands, and I didn't quite get whether that is an input parameter or whether that is, a, is something that comes out of the... Because, I mean, there is a kind of distinct thickness for granular materials at least of people say uh, whatever 10 times the particle the diameter not or something exactly. Like that. not exactly that is the input parameter so long as we can for a particular material we having we, this is the input parameter that we need to input so, so that is an input parameter okay 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 great um it's kind of an interesting question that I've actually been sort of thinking about myself. How steep is the learning curve for the SPH? If you want to start with the SPH, is it something that, um, how long would it take you to, what, what, what do you reckon with the, so like the, the degree of difficulty compared maybe to the MPM and other sort of methods? Well, uh, what I can say at Monas, I have the postgraduate course in SPS. I, I teach the methods in four weeks. Okay. And after four weeks, after four weeks, I'm expecting master student to be able to implement a simple, some sort of the MUI regulatory model in SPS. And that is some sort of assignment they have to do. Another one is um, we're going to have uh, um, within the um, alert geomaterial in Europe, we're going to have the um, uh, 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 PhD course on particle methods in October. 
um, this is um, where uh, we also um, um, going to having the short course in SPS. Okay, okay, interesting. So, so uh, keep a keep a lookout for that. Um, kinematic boundary conditions with the SPH. Go, are you using ghost particles? For the, for, 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 yeah. for 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 week one. Uh, kinematic here. Okay, how do you apply kinematic boundary conditions within SPH model? Are you using ghost particle? <coughs> Kinematic boundary. Uh, well, um, now th this is um, another question. Now we have um, with uh, um, um, in SPS we having uh, several different ways to apply the boundary condition. We can impose the boundary condition directly to a particle on the free surface, or we can using some sort of boundary particle like ghost particle, virtual particle to impose a boundary condition. So uh, we uh, we we having different ways similar to FEM. We can use different methods. Uh, to, to impose a boundary condition. Okay, we have actually a couple of raised hands and we might take a question from David. Uh, oh no, he just put down his hand. I guess that was uh, related to the, to the, to the shear band thickness. So that is the only parameter uh, uh, is required for this. You could call it a regularization, but it's more than that somehow, right? Is that the only, let's say, microscopic parameter you need or is, is there more? Um, so at the moment in SPS, um, we have, um, uh, yes, the shear band thickness is the only parameter that we need to input for this model. Okay. And, and in, um, related to this, so what you basically showed is, uh, and it's on one of these slides, maybe slide 12, I think, uh, or let us just stay with this slide. Um, the one where you have that the that the stress strain response that you actually measure is sort of the average is some sort of average between what goes on in the shear band and what goes on outside the shear band. Yeah, yeah. So, so when we have, but that's the result. That's sort of classically the result we have from experiments. Yes. And so we need. Have, yeah. Keep and then on, yeah. Have to somehow. I mean, what are the implications of the, I mean, are we doing experiments in the right way or could it be done in, a, in another way where we would have more useful direct input for, for, for this type of, of, of approach? Because you have to so, sort of back calculate the measured response, right? Um, that's right. I think actually at the moment we are submitting a paper on the, on the, uh, to the geotechnics. We are actually using this approach to back calculate the material inside, the material behavior inside and outside localization zone based on our observation. So what we measure is we measure the macro stress strain response. We see the shear band thickness and we're using that information put back to the concept model. We can get out what is the material behavior inside and outside localizing zone. So that's one of the, the approach we can, we, can, we can apply for this particular model. Yeah, yeah. Um, the key idea that I want to highlight in this in this uh, in this model is, uh, at the moment, uh, you know that all of our existing transit model did not um, uh, consider the localization band within the RVE, and as a result, um, we we don't actually correctly capture the localized failure. So uh, what we, uh, there's a different kind of method that has been proposed, like radiant methods, but that actually doing after some sort of the localization occur which is the, the after talk, that sort of thing. So that, that's the key idea we want, to, um, we want to highlight here. If you want to correctly capture the onset and port failure, you need a currency model which represents or replicated the, the physics of the material behavior. Sure, 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 sure. That is great. I think we are, um, we are, we are past the hour now, so... Um, I think we will we will we will close it here and um, thanks for uh, attending and and thanks for your questions and thanks especially to the speaker for a very interesting uh, and actually quite inspiring um, I think uh, presentation that was really great uh, thanks Ha for that if you will just hang on we can have a small chat afterwards otherwise yeah. if that doesn't work I'll send you a link very shortly a new link so yeah we will have the um, if you just should stop sharing your screen. 
Yeah, so um, for those who actually haven't got the, the answer, you can send me an email anytime um, on a question related to my talk. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. And uh, yeah, just as a, re as a very brief reminder here, we have the next webinar in two weeks. It's going to be uh, Jidong Zhao from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And it's going to be on a related subject in a way uh, related to multi-scale modeling. Um, so for those of you who are interested in that, uh, please make sure to catch that. But for now, that's it. And um, thank you. Hey, everyone.